Hey, what's up guys? My name is Faison and in this video, we're going to be continuing to discuss about the physics of a boom lever. So if you're interested in boom levers or you're thinking about competing in the event, make sure you stay until the end because this video is going to give you an insane amount of value. Before we get into the video, please be sure to leave a like, drop any questions or feedback in the comments below, follow me on social media, my links will be in the description below, or you can find my tags in the end screen. And if you enjoy content about science, technology, or engineering, please consider subscribing to the channel because I post new videos just like this every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And with that out of the way, let's get right into the video. So if you haven't watched my previous video, I basically went over discussing how you can calculate the amount of force that's being applied to each and every member of your boom lever through the use of static analysis. And in this video, we will be discussing how you can strengthen your beams of your boom lever so that they can become able to withhold the loads that were calculated in part one. So if you haven't watched part one, I'll leave a link in the description below or I'll put a card up on the screen right now that will take you to that video. But Again, we will be talking about how you can improve the strength of your individual beams to make them stronger. And the first uh, tip that I'm going to give you, or physics concept that we're going to talk about, is that a boom lever is much different than a bridge or a tower. Now, if you're not already familiar, a boom lever is what is considered a cantilever. And the way that a cantilever is distinguished from, say, a tower or a bridge is from the main beam. Now, if you look at a main, at the main beam, a uh, compression beam for a boom lever, you notice that there's load being placed at the distal end. And what that does is it sort of bends that beam downwards like this. But if you compare the beam of a cantilever to that, let's say, of a bridge, where the load is placed in the center of the beam, then the beam doesn't bend at one end, but rather the bends inward, where there are reaction forces on both ends. But again, if we look at a cantilever where it's bending downwards, the reaction forces are on the opposite end of that load force. So it becomes a lot harder to deal with the elasticity, uh, the elastic properties of wood for a cantilever than it is for a boom lever, simply because on a bridge, uh, on a excuse me, I meant to say, that is a lot different for a cantilever compared to a bridge because when you look at the beams of a bridge, you have reacting forces on both ends of the load, which allows it to be evenly distributed, while on a cantilever, it's on the opposite end of that load force. And because it's a greater distance away from the load force, it is a lot harder to manage that force for cantilevers. So now that you're familiar with how cantilevers and boom levers in general function in terms of their beams and the load forces, you now should be able to understand these different physics concepts that will allow your boom levers beams to strengthen and hold a greater load force. And the first way to do that, and the primary way actually, is to reduce the moment of inertia placed on those beams. And what, moment, what the moment of inertia is, is the angular velocity or torsion that is caused from that load. So the greater your resistance to that torsion or angular, angular velocity caused by that load, the lower the moment of inertia. And one way to increase the moment of inertia, or excuse me, decrease the moment of inertia on your boom lever beams is to increase the cross-sectional area of the compression pieces or the pieces you want to lower the moment of inertia on. So for example, if I had a square, let's say a cross section of a rectangular piece, that's a square, and that square, one of them is one eighth by one eighth. And another cross sectional piece of a, another cross sectional area of a piece is a one fourth by one fourth square. Now, although you may have a heavier piece for that one fourth by one fourth by however long you want your boom lever to be. 
although it may be heavier, it has a lower moment of inertia because there is a greater amount of area. And again, if you want a more clear description of this, which goes more into depth and has a lot of helpful diagrams, then I highly recommend you check out the post I made about this exact topic. The link, will, the link to that will be in the description below. So just click on that link, it'll take you to my website and you'll find some really helpful diagrams that help explain moment of inertia and how area is able to affect moment of inertia. So when you're trying to make the moment of inertia for your boom lever beams less, you're not restricted to just increasing the area. In fact, that's the place where most boom lever builders go wrong. In fact, you are able to increase the projected area is what I like to call it. And by increasing the projected area, you do increase the moment of inertia. Now, what I mean by projected area is the use of hollow like structures. So for example, in a previous video, I talked about how two boom levers are a great way to spike your efficiency, your efficiency. And the reason that two boom levers work so well is because they have a great amount of projected area. And that's because if you make a one inch, uh, one inch diameter balsa wood tube, it spans a roughly 3.14 inches, or yeah, 3.14 inches squared of area. And that has the same amount of moment of inertia of a solid cylinder that is that has a diameter of one inch. So because the moment of inertia is still the same, depending on, regardless of if it's hollow or not, then you should be able to get the same amount of results or same good results by using hollow structures. And this is the point I'm trying to get at. So if you look at the boom lever competition as it is right now, you are probably seeing a bunch of box designs where they have four different members, two on top, two on bottom, and then they're braced along each edge. And those boom levers hold surprisingly a great amount of weight. Even though they're just made of one eighth by one eighth by 40 inch by 40 centimeters in length, they are still able to hold that great amount of load. And the reason that this is possible is because that they span a great amount of projected area. And because they do so, the moment of inertia on those beams or that one unison unified beam is much lower than if you would use just two really big and really thick beams or pieces of wood to hold that load. So if you want to improve your results, one physics concept to understand is that you should increase the projected area of your individual beams. Now the last way and also the easiest way to go about improving your boom lever in terms of physics is to use bracing. Now this all boils down to one physics concept that we refer to as buckling. And Buckling is essentially where if you compress a beam of wood, it tends to bend upwards or downwards. So buckling strength is the amount of energy it takes to compress a wooden beam and for that wooden beam to bend or bow outwards. And the greater the buckling strength of your beam members, the greater the amount of, excuse me, the greater the strength or resistance your boom lever has to deforming from that load or even breaking. Now, what bracing does is it divides your boom lever member, excuse me, members into individual and tiny sections. And for each in, and for and as the member gets divided into smaller and smaller chunks, it becomes harder and harder to bow that piece outwards. And you can think, look at this in the real world. So take, for example, if you take a 12 foot long piece of wood or balsa wood and you try to bend it, it's relatively easy. But if you take that same type of wood, but cut it down from 12 inches long to six inches long and try bending it, it's, you're still able to bend it, 
but it takes a little bit more force to do so. And again, that's the point I'm getting at. When you divide your boom lever into smaller and smaller sections through bracing, so if you improve, include more bracing onto your beams, then that divides your boom lever members into smaller and smaller segments. And the smaller those segments get, the stronger your boom lever is in terms of compression. So that's going to help you drastically. If you want a quick and easy solution, just put more bracing on your compression members. Now, if you found anything I talked about sort of confusing, or you want even more information about the physics of a boom lever, I'll leave a link in the description below that will take you to my website where I go more into depth about each and every physics concept I talk about today, as well as go into some new ones that we haven't covered in this video. And if you like this video, please be sure to drop a like on this video. If you have any questions or feedback, you can leave them in the comments below. You can even follow me on social media. I'll put my tags in the end screen, or you can find the links to my social media pages in the description below as well. And if you like videos about science, technology, or engineering, and even game development or other science type projects, please be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell because I post new videos like this every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And that's all guys, I'll catch you guys next time. Stay unfazed. <laughs>